Good evening. Good Thank you for coming. So, um, our topic tonight is child development, especially between the ages of six and ten. But to do that, I'm also going to have to go a bit earlier than that. Yeah. Last time, uh, I talked about the educational task of helping the children integrate the different le levels of their being, to basically to help them integrate their consciousness with their vitality. And when children are first born, all being well, they have a lot of vitality. Um, and that includes not just general state of health, but the capacity to grow as well. And what they don't have very much of is consciousness. They have the consciousness of their senses, but they're not thinking about things too much. That's going to come later. When we're talking about um, child development, we're talking about the things that happen to us as we grow. Uh, that nobody in particular is doing. Yeah. They just, they just happen. Yeah. And um, they are very powerful forces that are making these changes happen. And if we decide it right, so um, my child is, um, my child is, 13 years old now, it's time that they become able to reproduce one of their own kind. We wouldn't have a clue how to make that happen in them, but life knows how to do that. Yeah. Similarly, the uh, one-year-old gets an urge from someplace to sit up, to stand up, and then to start walking, yeah? Things that become increasingly like words start to come out of their mouths. Yeah, we can encourage that, we can praise that and so on, but we're not really responsible for making it happen. Yeah? So, um, if you're raising a child, you've got the stuff that you are doing, for your child, and then there's the stuff that's happening in them, to them, through them. Yeah. And also as educators, as teachers, we're, we need to be aware that what we are doing them, doing with them, is only a part of what's going on. Yeah, they're busy, they're quite busy children. Um, without all the stuff that we're asking them to do. They're busy growing, they're busy getting new teeth, shedding old teeth. All of these things are going on, yeah? And um, there are there are patterns to this growing and changing this development, thank goodness. Yes, we, can, we have some idea kind of what's supposed to happen, what usually happens at a given stage. Yeah. And if we, if we start from the, from the point of physical birth, the birth of the physical body, what birth means at that point is that the child's physical body becomes separate from the mother's physical body. It becomes viable outside of the mother's physical body. That's what birth means, okay? They don't radically change between in here and out there. It's the same, but now they're, they're ready to be viable, to breathe their own air, and they're still, of course, incredibly dependent on 
nourishment from the outside, care from the outside, all of these things, but their physical body can do what it needs to do to survive outside of the mother's physical body. Now, of course, this doesn't just happen like that. It has been prepared for by the conception and the long gestation over nine months or so. Now, these other layers of us, um, such as our, our consciousness, our ability to think, and so on, um, that's going to be born later. Yeah, our ability to really reason things out, to reflect on our own thought process, all of that is going to come later. So you could also speak of, use the word birth, in relation to all of those other faculties. And in child development we talk about not just the physical birth, but we talk about then a birth happening roughly every seven years continuing now yeah, as adults there are things that can be being born in us at different ages yeah. that's another talk um, so the other thing that is at the, the, the vitality pole of, of the human being in addition to the physical body is what you can call the life body or the formative forces body or the etheric body, Steiner gives it lots of different names. But what this body, if you, and it's called a body just because it's a, a kind of um, recognizable set of functions. Now, what it's doing is it's taking care of that physical body, it's making that physical body be alive physical body in itself isn't, isn't alive without that. The physical body is just the, the flesh and the bones and the nerves and you know, all of that. But if there's not blood going through those blood vessels from a beating heart, if there's not air coming in um, through living lungs, then the physical body can't really do much of anything. And this life body, it's not, only, um, it's not only keeping your heart pumping and your lungs functioning, it's also allowing you to grow. So it's allowing you to, um, uh, your, for cell division and cell growth and all of those kinds of things, it uh, allows metabolism to happen. It also, um, is what is responsible for these patterned changes that I'm talking about as child development. So um, it's responsible for the first teeth coming and then for the first teeth starting to fall out and be replaced by new teeth. And it's at about that place where the old teeth start falling away and the new teeth start appearing around the age of six or seven that uh, Steiner locates what he calls the birth of this life body that the light that marks a sign that the life body is now kind of independent of of the mother's parents life bodies and okay? it's in a certain way uh, it has enough of its own habits and functions working that it is viable, but it's a bit more complicated than that. Because the, this uh, life body is also taking care of the physical body in all of these ways. So um, when the child is first born, uh, as you know if you have a newborn, they don't have any conception of day or night. That rhythm doesn't really exist for them. The rhythm that exists for them is breathing, heart beating, and nourishment and pooping. Yeah, that's the rhythm that exists for them. And it's going to take some time to get into this night is when we sleep, darling, and day is when we're up for a little while and then we take a nap. Yeah, 
And then eventually we get to the place where day is when we're up and night is when we're asleep. Yeah? But all of that takes time. Yeah? And you can think about for your own children, when was it that they started being able to do that? When was it that they started being able to do that? Right? Um, the, this uh, life body is also helping the child develop gradually the capacity to, to some extent, control some of these bodily functions so that the poop isn't coming just automatically, but they can wait to poo or to pee or something like that. Yeah, so all of this is going on. And the etheric body, the life body, is busy with the child doing all this stuff and helping them grow and getting the teeth in there and, um, and working on the relationship of the heartbeat to the breath and all of these things are going on. And so that part of the child is very busy. Now that part of the child, that part of the child is the part that is aware of things like up and down and right and left and forward and back planes of space. Okay? So if you think about a tree, um, uh, if, it's a, if it's a certain kind of tree that's supposed to grow uh, and look like this, then the life forces of that tree, they kind of guide the tree into that shape, which is quite different from the shape of a tree that is supposed to look kind of like that. Yeah. This tree and that tree, they're both kind of, they grow into the shape that they're supposed to be. And human beings also have that shape that we are supposed to be. And we need our life forces to get us into that shape. And when the child is youngest, they have the, the, the biggest relationship of the, of the head to the limbs. The head is big in relation to the limbs. And then the limbs are going to start to grow down out of the head. Yeah. And gradually that means that the proportion of the head to the limbs is going to be smaller. Okay? And so one, one way to tell if a child is, might be ready for class one is can they touch their ear over the top of their head? Because that means enough of that vitality force which is still kind of situated in the head has flown out into the limbs so that you can start asking questions of this child because they don't, they don't need their head for growing in the same way. Yeah, they, they've kind of started that process. You can also start at that point expecting them to develop a sense for difference between right and left. So you can, you can write something like, uh, like that yeah? and have that be different from that or that. Yeah? All of that is kind of the business of this formative body. And if it's busy shaping the child, and we're asking it to do this kind of work, we're putting uh, 37 plus 26 in front of it, which requires this difference between left and right, then we're stealing away forces of vitality and using them for consciousness. And vitality and consciousness are polaric opposites. We need them both, but we need them in balance, and we need them at different times. Yes, if I'm asking you a math sum while you are dancing, your thinking isn't going to be very clear. If I asked you that math sum or I asked you any difficult question, you would probably stop dancing so that you could think. Yeah? Because when you're in the vitality mode, it's hard for you to access your consciousness. And when you're in consciousness mode, it's hard to also move with, with vigor because you need to be thinking about things, okay? So they're kind of opposite. And so it matters 
what we what what we try to draw out of the children before that etheric birth happens around seven years old. Okay, so with um, with little kids, we think sometimes as the well-intentioned adults that we are. I want my child to, as an adult, to be able to know what they want, say what they want, and make their own decisions in life. So I'm going to give them lots of decisions when they're three years old, four years old, five years old, so they have lots of practice in that. When they're this adult that you want them to be, they're going to have a certain functioning reason of consciousness and hopefully a little bit of wisdom, yeah, which they don't have when they're three or four or five years old, yeah? So their ability to think about things, prioritize, weigh up options, isn't very developed at that time at all. And so what we do by asking them those questions when they're that young is we make them nervous and anxious. We make them think, you're my dad, why don't you know the answer to this question? You're my mom, shouldn't you know what I should eat for supper today? Why is that on me? I'm three. Yeah? And so you end up creating a, kind of the opposite of confidence by asking too many inappropriate questions when they are little. Now what they're good at when they're little is imitating, and they're good at imitating because they don't really have a boundary between themselves and the rest of the world. They don't have their own private inner space. If a, if a two-year-old is going through something inwardly, you'll know. Yes, they're not going to say, God, this is really upsetting, but my mom's had a tough day, so I'm just going to keep this in. Yeah? <laughs> they're not going to do that. There's no place for them to keep it. Yeah? So, um, so that means because there isn't any boundary, they naturally kind of flow with what the adults around them are doing. They have a, a, a genius for imitation. And they pick up the little tricks of speech that you have so that their voice ends up sounding like your voice and little movement quirks and they pick up all of that stuff you know, in a way they wouldn't be able to do later. Because that's really their ability at that time is to imitate. Yeah. Okay, so now we get to six years old, seven years old, losing teeth, can reach over so the, the, the limbs are starting to get a little bit longer. And so now you can start asking me certain kinds of questions, certain kinds of appropriate questions. Now, I'm going to deviate a little bit here from, from Waldorf orthodoxy when I say that I don't think the etheric body is actually born yet at seven years old. I think the etheric body goes into a kind of labor at seven years old, but I don't think it's actually really born until about nine. And nine is a big year in Waldorf education. <laughs> it's a big year in child development. Think about how you were at six. Do you have any memories from when you were six? Yeah. What was the world like? What were you like when you were six? And then think, what was I like when I was 10? What was the world like when I was 10? And if you have memories of that time, you'll realize something big happened in between there. Because before that, when I was six, I was like, whew, reacting very immediately to the world. And, and when, when I was 10, 11 years old, I was watching a lot more. I was still participating as well, but I was able to watch a lot more. I was able to hold grudges. I was able to be afraid of people. I was able to compare, make comparisons between me and somebody else at that age. So somehow this barrier had come in. Now, um, So this labor that I'm talking about, this process of, of, because um, I think I, th I think that the etheric body has in a way been been gestating all of this time, 
but then from about six, seven to about nine, there's a process of actually bringing it into its independence. And so it's not unusual if your um, seven-year-old or eight-year-old doesn't quite have right and left sorted out yet. And that's not that unusual. Okay. Um, you start to be a little bit worried or start to feel like some intervention needs to happen if at nine they still don't have right and left figured out. Because okay. by that time we do want to have a, a kind of sense of a certain spatial geography, certain body awareness, yeah. All of the thinking that we're going to do, all the clarity of our thinking, is built on the planes of space. So I need to have a clear sense of top versus bottom. I need to have a clear sense of right versus left, and I need to have a clear sense of forward versus back. Yeah. And so in class one and class two, a lot of the teaching that we do is very actively, very deliberately using those planes of space, right and left and up and down and forward and back, to teach things, teach language things, teach maths things. Yeah, so we're connecting what are going to be these mental processes with a really clear sense of how space works. Okay. So um, this is perhaps a moment, and I, I, won't, uh, I won't labor it too much, but um, think about what happens when you watch television or you watch a video on your phone computer, whatever it is. What happens to space? I see this person's head facing that way, and then that disappears. And I see this person's face facing that way all of a sudden, and that lasts for two seconds, and then I see a picture of a field with a mountain in the background. What is that doing to my sense of the planes of space? It's making a complete chaos out of it. Yeah? And the unfortunate thing is that instead of screaming and throwing the thing down on the ground, the intelligent child will try to adapt to what, it, to what that is and how that language works. Yeah? They'll try to kind of, they'll enter into that chaos, yeah? which isn't actually doing them any good. Because what they need at four, five, six is real space with their real body in it. Do you see what I mean? So it doesn't matter if it's the sweetest, most wonderful, heartwarming uh, nature show or whatever it is that they're watching, the nature of the medium perverts and distorts the nature of space, which is bad news for a developing child. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, like I said, I won't, I won't belabor <laughs> that point. So we have this child who is now, let's say, six years old, seven years old, let's say seven years old. And um, so we're doing work with right and left, and we're moving, and we're developing a sense of rhythm. It's another reason that I think that the etheric body isn't really born until nine, because the etheric body is all about rhythm. It's all about rhythm. Your heart, your breathing, yeah? It's all about rhythm. Life processes are about rhythm, yeah? They're really boring, they're really regular, hopefully, yeah? And they're all about rhythm. So for a young child, a young child, a child up to, certainly up until nine, feels secure in rhythm. If every day is a little bit the same, that feels good. I like that. Yeah. If every lesson starts with, we say our verse, and then we do some singing, and then we do call what was the previous day, and so on and so forth, that feels good. Yeah. I like it that way. That helps me feel secure. And that, it's that security that's going to make me the confident, bold, daring adult later. Yeah. 
rhythm, 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 rhythm. Okay, at this at, at this time, um, and so we're we're building that into into the lessons. And what are we teaching them? What are we teaching them? Fairy tales are the main narrative content. And then we're teaching numbers, but we're starting with the qualities of numbers. So we're starting in a way with, with both language and number as archetype. So one isn't just a discrete quantity, it's an archetype for wholeness, for singularity. Yeah. One is, is a, an amazing number because it can be the biggest number that has everything in it. What is there one of? There's the universe. But it's also the most unique individual number. What is, else is there one of me? Yeah. So one is able to carry both of those archetypes. Yeah. So it's kind of the God number, number one. Yeah. It's everything and it's the, the each unique thing. Yeah. Two is a very different archetype. Two is the in-breath and the out-breath. It's the dark and the light. It's the male and the female. It's, it's all of these things in two. Yeah. Um, three is another archetype. It's more elusive, that one, but the triangle, something s stable but dynamic. It's different from the stability of four. Yeah, four, so we have like the, the base of the house is a four, and then the, the consciousness part of the house up here is a triangle. It's three. And so on and so forth. And we have the four seasons and, and five fingers on your hand and, and five-pointed star when we stand up and all of these things. So we're starting with the numbers as archetypes. And then in the stories, we're also, stories, the songs, the poems, we're also nourishing the child with archetypes, which are telling them, this is what the world is like. Yeah, this is what the world is like in a really profound way. And every fairy tale, every fairy tale is, you can see it as one person. So in the fairy tale of the frog prince, the frog is the kind of vitality part of us, the slimy, at sorting out our pooing habits when we're two years old, <laughs> yes? That's the frog bit. And it's the part that can go into the depths to bring up what the other part has lost. Yeah, so it's incredibly vital, rejuvenative, this part of us. The princess, who is so beautiful that every time she walks out of the palace, the sun itself gazes with wonder upon her. That's the light part, the consciousness part, the awakeness of us. And the awakeness part in the fairy tale wants to kind of use the vitality part, but then it wants to disown it and say, oh, just a I'm the princess, I'm what matters. Yeah. And the story is about how they need to find their right connection including their right distinction. They're not supposed to just merge into each other. The frog needs to stay the frog, and the princess needs to stay the princess. Well, the frog needs to stay the frog until he becomes the prince, but, <laughs> but it's not about just losing those qualities. It's about finding their right relationship to each other. Yeah. Okay. So what does the princess owe to that part? How far can this part push this part? That's what they're working out in that fairy tale. So in class one, we're, we're meeting this stage where the child is kind of becoming a new, um, a new entity in the world of patterns. Because the etheric body is a body of patterns. Yeah? Everything about these rhythms, these patterns, yeah. And so we're giving the most basic patterns we can find through these stories, through these archetypes. 
right? In class two, we're getting closer to the birth of this individuality, and we kind of, we kind of um, shift, we, we come one step further down out of the universal archetype into the type. And so not the archetype, the big type, but the type like the greedy man, the, um, the vain uh, person, the, the, uh, those kinds of types in the stories of the fables and so on. And we come into the, a world that is less unified. We come into a world of contrasts for the, for the eight-year-old. So the, on the one hand in the curriculum, we have these uh, stories of foolishness. The fables are always stories of foolishness of one kind or another. There's always somebody being foolish in a fable. Yeah? And then you have the stories of the saints and sages who show what human beings can be like when we don't succumb to that foolishness. Yeah. So it's getting to be a bit more dark and light yeah, out of this unity of the class one. Um, I should also say about class one that a big, big part of teaching class one is developing classroom habits, developing school habits. Again, it's you are now independent citizens of the etheric world and you need to be, be social in that. You need to have a community that also has its rhythms, the things that we do, the ways we behave. How do we get our crayons out? How do we put our crayons away? If we're lining up to come to an assembly, how do we do that? And a good class one teacher will spend a lot of time with those developing those habits as the lesson. And they are as important as learning to count or anything else. Yeah, those are important lessons. How do we behave with other people in this, in this kind of setting? It's one of the signs that a child is ready for um, class one also that that they are ready to commit themselves to a situation like that. So this isn't just my family situation anymore. It is to some extent artificial, this community at school. And I'm ready for that. Yeah, I'm, I am of myself enough that I don't need my mother and father to shape me all the time. I can give myself to this new situation. Um, I can sit at a desk, which, is also, which also means that I've separated this part of me from that part enough that I can keep this part still when this part is still busy and moving around. A good uh, test to do if you want to see if a child is ready for class one is also to toss them a beanbag and see if they catch it like this. Do they still need their legs to catch it? Or can they keep their feet on the ground and move their hands? Because if they're doing this, it's going to be very hard for them to sit at a desk for any period of time at all. Their, their etheric body is still needing to do some work for them. Okay? So now we come to this place, this, this nine-year-old Rubicon. Yes, that's the word we like to use, the Rubicon, which is a river that Julius Caesar crossed when he came back from Gaul and he was told by the authorities in Rome, if you cross this river, there's going to be civil war. If you cross this river with your army, there's going to be civil war. And so a Rubicon is a thing that once you cross it, there's no going back. <laughs> the children will also, will often interestingly try to go back. Sometimes your nine or 10 year old will have bouts where they just want to curl up with mommy again. Yeah because that was so nice, <laughs> yeah, or daddy, yeah. But they're doing that partly because they know they can't, because they know that they're, they're in another space. Now, what is it that's happening there? What is it that's happening? Think about a plant. Think about a flowering plant, okay? So um, here it is, and when it starts to grow, um, it has leaves like this, and then as it goes closer to the flower, the leaves often get much smaller, and then we have this thing. Okay? 
then we have this blossom. Now the leaves are flat. They're two-dimensional, basically. Of course, they you know, waver a little bit, but they're basically flat. They don't have an inside space. The blossom has an inside space. Okay, and the fruit will have an inside space. So up until about the age of nine, the children are leaves. They're flat. They don't have an inside space. And now the vitality that pushed these leaves out like this starts to withdraw a little bit, and something new comes in which cannot quite be explained by this. Yeah, there's not really, other than our habit of expectation, there's nothing here which sort of leads you, which prepares you for, out of these green flat things, to have a red round thing. Yeah? It's a bit of a surprise. It's coming from another place. And something is going to come from another place to your child as well at this age. And they are going to develop their inner space. They're going to become three-dimensional. Before that time, if your child got upset, yeah, their, their emotion would come and it would shake that leaf that they are, and they would creep, scream, and they would cry, or they would laugh, or they would do whatever they do, and five minutes later, it might be gone. But what's going to start to happen is that when that emotion comes in, it's not just going to shake me this way. I'm going to make a home for it. Yeah. I'm going to start letting it rattle around in there. Okay. And for some children, this time can be a time of insecurity. Because it's like, suddenly, I have my own thoughts and my own feelings, and you don't know what they are. You don't know what I'm thinking. And with that comes the thought, I don't know what you're thinking either. You say you're my mother. How could I know? <laughs> yes. yeah. What are you really thinking right now? Yeah. And so it can be a time of insecurity. It isn't for all children, but for some children it can be. Comparisons become possible because now I'm over here and you're over there and I have enough detachment that I can I can compare your situation to my situation. Which can also be unsettling. So, um, now with this come some great gifts as well. So I have enough detachment now that I can control myself a little bit better. Yeah, so in behavior management for class one or class two, you just kind of have to be very artful about how you shape the day and how you shape the lesson because you could tell Johnny in class one, um, don't do that, don't behave that way, but Johnny can't actually do a whole lot about it. He doesn't have that inner space that he can hold that in. Yeah, it's very hard for a child of that age to modify their behavior according to um, instruction. They can learn to modify it through the habits that they have in the family and in the classroom. That's why those habits are so important. Yeah? But they can't just decide to change it. Yeah? Oh, he's telling me he'd like me to sit tight for two minutes and then I can talk. Okay, well, no. If I if I'm, have the impulse to talk, it's probably going to come out. Yeah. Okay, but now, after this, I have a better chance that I can do that. I have a better chance that I can um, think clearly about numbers, about language, about whatever it is that we're doing in, in school. Yeah. So, um, uh, there is also um, 
often a, a, a new capacity for, for an independent will. Okay? Little foreshadowings of teenagehood. So we're not just talking about the parent talks and the child resists and says, I don't want to, which they can do from a very early age. Yeah? They don't really need an independent will for that. They just need a certain amount of reactivity. But for a child to have their own ideas about what they are now going to do, yeah. that, that takes another step at about this age as well. And emotionally, with the separation, can come the beginnings also of empathy. Before, there might be a lot of just natural sympathy, which comes from the fact that I don't have a barrier between me and you, and so I, if you're going through something, I'm going through it as well. But that's different from saying, ooh, that must be hard. Yeah. I'm not upset, but I can see that you're upset. And so I care because I'm seeing that, that you are upset. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So there are lots of really, really important gifts that come at this time. It's not just a... Uh, a, a sort of um, turbulence yeah, that we want to brace ourselves against. We want to welcome this time. Yeah. Okay. Now, the curriculum does basically two things. The Waldorf curriculum does two, two things at this time. So it says, right, you are a new citizen of Earth. That's what being an Earth citizen is. It means you're in your body. And you're kind of alone in there. Yeah. And so what do you need? You need a home. Yeah, you need to, let's build that wall, let's build a shelter, let's put a sheath around you in the form of clothing. So all of these things, so farming, building, um, we need to feed you as a citizen of Earth. You need that, okay? So we, we take the children through all of the things that they need in order to be a grounded person on the Earth during that time. And then we tell also a series of stories about which start from a condition of paradise, Garden of Eden, where everything just kind of is given. And then we show them how the, these people, they make an independent decision. <laughs> they say, so the, the, the serpent gives them a comparison, you guys can be like God. Oh, never occurred to me before. But we could, yeah. If we know this, we could do that. And so they get this, they decide they want this inner space. And not so much as a punishment, but just as an effect of that decision, they are now without the help that they had before. Because they, are, they have built this wall between them and what was sustaining them. So we have that story. But then in Hebrew mythology we have more because we have, we go through a whole journey through the year of, first of all, God is talking to you directly. God is just there talking to you directly, giving you stuff. Yes. And then gradually it becomes that only kind of special people like Abraham can hear that conversation, can participate in that conversation. A lot of people can't have that conversation anymore. And then it becomes, with Moses, he can't quite have it directly spiritually anymore. He has to have it through nature. He has to have it through a burning bush. He has to have it through a big mountain. And then gradually that's going to go further. And now the leaders can't, can't have that conversation at all anymore at a certain point. And they need prophets who can still have that connection. We need to talk to the kings to tell them what to do. And then gradually the prophets themselves stop seeing it in nature and stop hearing voices from the cosmos. And there's this amazing moment when Elijah the prophet says, there's a passage which says, the Lord wasn't in the wind, the Lord wasn't in the fire, the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. But what did he hear? He heard a still, small voice here. Yeah. So we're taking the children through the journey of individuality. You're just at the start of your journey as an individual right now, as a nine-year-old. But this is going to be 
your glory eventually, is that your individuality is going to be able to align with whatever power you want to align with, and you will have whatever is holy in the universe inside you, yeah, inside your own heart. So that's the journey through the Old Testament, through the Hebrew mythology. Okay. Now, um, we get to class four, we make it to class four. And usually things have kind of settled down a little bit. Class three is often a time where there are certain um, wobbles for, for some children. And we get to class four. And often class four is quite a, a rambunctious year. A um, lot of activity, a lot of energy. You can get a class four to do a lot of work. Yeah. And class four is about holes and parts. So now you're down here on the earth. Class three, you established what you need to survive on the earth. You had a glimpse of the journey awaiting you. And now in class four, everything is a whole that now we are going to start divvying up into parts. So in mass, we start looking at fractions. Yeah, here's the pizza, here are the separate pieces of pizza. Okay. Local geography. Here's my world, my world has just been the world before. Okay? And now we're going to start making maps of it. And the capacity to sort of have that bird's eye view is the capacity that comes to most children about the age of 10. So we can start drawing maps. We can start looking at the route, the different places we have to go through to get from our house to school. We can look at my room has this over here, and that over there, and that over there, and that over there. And my room is in this place in relation to the whole house. We can start to relate the holes and the parts. Okay? We start to write in paragraphs. And a paragraph is basically a whole that is divided into parts. So we ask the children, um, make a list of five things that are fun to do on holiday. And you talk about it a bit, and they each have their list of five things, or maybe ten things that are exciting to do on holiday, depending on how enthusiastic they are. And then you start, you say, now we're going to turn that into one paragraph. And the first sentence of our paragraph is, there are lots of fun things to do on holiday. And then you're going to basically write a sentence about each one of those things, and you've got a nice paragraph there. Listening to stories, you start to say to the children, okay, I'm going to tell you the story of how Thor lost his hammer. Okay. Norse mythology, lots of energy. Yes. And afterwards, I'm going to ask you to say what were the different parts of the story. And they'll, find, they'll come to the ability to say, right, so at first, they're in Asgard, and Thor is looking for his hammer, he's not finding it, and he's accusing Loki and so on and so forth. So that's the first part of the story. And then the second part of the story is when Loki goes to Jotunheim and meets Thrym and finds out that Thrym has stolen Thor's hammer and buried it in the earth and is not going to give it back unless a goddess Freya will um, become his wife. So that's the second bit of the story. And then the third bit of the story is how the gods try to work out what they're going to do. And the last bit of the story is when they do it. Okay? And so we're taking the organism of the story and we're starting to divide it up into fractions. Okay? So everything's going on, not just in the fractions main lesson, but in the local geography main lesson, in the, in the uh, language lessons. They're all helping the children navigate these holes and parts and find out where we are. Yes, so it's like we've landed in class three and now we're moving in concentric circles out from that. Okay. Now, um, let's see if I left out anything crucial. All right, so the next talk next month will be about child development from 11 upwards yeah, into adolescence and into teenagehood. That's where we'll go next time.
Are there questions from this evening? Yes, please. So I was thinking of um, when you're talking about the difference between before and after uh -huh. the, the, the Rubicon, I was thinking yeah. of my son and my daughter, because my daughter is 11 and my son is four and a half. Uh -huh. And my son is exactly like the leaves. Every everything shakes him up, <laughs> and then he stops right away. Uh -huh. And then yeah. the sister will be the one rolling her eyes. Yeah. And he's doing it again. Um, but so for for I feel well, we are gonna listen to Beyond Eleven <laughs> next time. So I'm not dealing with her. But for my son, um, he's a very typical boy, mm -hmm. and he loves cars, mm. and he loves reading about cars. Mm. And I find it very hard to introduce fairy tales to him. Because it's no cars. So, do you have any, and, and also for me, because I know about the class one curriculum, mm -hmm. but so it feels to me like children are supposed to um, listen to fairy tales from kindergarten to grade mm -hmm. one. Um, how do you distinguish between these years? Four, to four is. Four is nursery rhymes. Four, is, four isn't really fairy tales. Okay. Um, I would say five and six, and and I would choose different fairy tales for kindergarten yeah. than I would choose for class one. Class one fairy tales are going to be a little bit more structural mm -hmm. in a certain way, They'll, and there will be a bit more of a journey through it. Yeah. Whereas um, kindergarten fairy tales. Yeah. All he reads about now are cars. Oh, he's, he's four. So um, uh, my stepson uh, was brought up almost solely by his, his mother for his first five years. And um, uh, she being a forward-thinking 20th century um, adult offered him a whole range of things that he could play with and do and so on and so forth. And there was one thing he was interested in. No, there were two things he was interested in. One thing he was interested in was diggers. <laughs> if you were traveling somewhere and there was a digger, stop! <laughs> yes, he wanted to see the digger. He loved diggers. And the other thing was any stick. Any stick. <laughs> any stick was a shooter. Oh, now, much, now yes. guns were banned. Yeah? He, saw, he had no media. Yeah, but somewhere in his little three-year-old, four-year-old boyness, a stick somehow, and I and and I was kind of coming on the picture at that time. I was trying to figure out what what is it about that, and it somehow it's this power at a distance kind of thing that it. If I go, if I point this over there and I go, then I have some kind of magical power. Yeah. But he loved the fairy tales when he got to age six and seven, yeah? So it's like the fairy tales are already a certain level of sophistication. Um, what's going on at four is much more primal, but somehow. <laughs> what can I do to nurture, nourish him to... Well, just at this stage, what is the right nourishment? Can, can he play imaginatively with the cars? Yes. That's fine then. That's cool. That's good. That's what matters, is that he can play in, that his, with his imagination, he can create stories. That's, that's more important than anything at that point. Yeah? That, and that he can play with them with other people. So socialization is important at that age. Sure. Yeah? I, I, I have no idea. This yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and imagine an imaginative play. Yeah, that's what he should be doing. Yeah. Now I should say, when this birth happens at nine, in my opinion, the other thing that happens at the same time is it's like the conception of what we're going to call the astral body or the soul body. Okay. So that's going to be born when the, when the child is 13 or 14, where they have their own very full inner life, yeah? which is independent of yours. Yeah. Yeah. Yours is, in fact, embarrassing to theirs. Yes. So if you're out 
and you're singing somewhere, oh God, mom. Yeah? Don't want your inner life. I've got my inner life. Yeah? Yeah? They, they are not in the same world anymore at all. Yeah? Whereas a younger child, if mom is singing, they would sing along, you know, or something like that. Yeah? So that's the other thing that's going to happen. And that's why in, from grade three, grade four, it's the teacher's soul body, the teacher's and the soul body is the body that appreciates beauty, that can create beauty, that is clear in its thinking, strong in its uh, will, and um, warm in its feeling. It's that which is going to educate the child through those years. Yeah, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that next time. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I, I want to say if questions occur to people, we should have a way that they can get to me. Yeah, that they send them to you, and we'll find a way to engage uh, in a dialogue. Yeah. So, in your years of teaching, have mm -hmm. you noticed any change in children's like at what age do they come to the Rubicon, or or the way that they're, they're, they're what I've noticed generally is that um, since children have had access to screens from birth. Um, all of the stages are a bit more chaotic and um, also the integration of the soul with the body is more chaotic uh, because um, it is primarily a corruption of the will. Yeah, it primarily, it, 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 I would say, can confuse their thinking, it can stimulate their thinking, they get into their nerve sense system a bit too early yeah, um, it, it can make their feeling life a little bit numb because they're emoting about things that aren't real yeah, and forgetting to emote about things that are real. But the real corruption happens in the will that I just don't want to do anything. Yeah, I, I, and, and that's where you get, I don't want to listen to your fairy tales. I don't want to dig in the garden. I don't want to go for a walk. I don't want to do anything. Yeah, because I'm so used to my dopamine hits from this machine that that's what I want. That's what makes me feel good and that's what I know. Yeah. And those things are not rhythmic. Yeah. They're not rhythmic. They're instant. Yeah. If, if you know, we've all experienced as adults, if something takes like five seconds to load, we're like, God, this thing is so slow! Yes, and we lose our own center as adults. If our machine takes five seconds to load something that we're expecting to load like that. Yeah. So um, uh, I'd say it, 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 it throws an element of, of, of chaos into when these changes happen, how they happen, um, because you know, there's also exposure to astral things that they don't have any use for uh, at that age, and so on and so forth. So, it's, um, I, these forces, as I said, they're incredibly strong. Yeah, they're incredibly strong. When your child reaches adolescence, they're going to start have, going through adolescent processes. That's going to happen, yeah? And even if they've been on the screen all the time. But they may not be able to make the best use of those changes. They may not be able to turn that to a, a, a healthy social life, um, a clear thinking life, um, a, 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 an ability to make good decisions. Yeah. But the, the forces are still there. The forces will still do what they do. But I, I would definitely say there's more confusion. I would say things are a little bit earlier than they were. Um, here in Hong Kong, my experience so far is that the children are about six to eight months behind where they were in the UK, where they uh, have been falling for longer. <laughs> so there's still, a, there's still a longer period of openness to parents and openness to the imagination and, and all of that here than there is it there. But, but what I do see here more than what I see there is the crisis in the will. I see lots of kids and, and 
And I also hear things from people I know who are working with groups of children who are not from all their schools, where getting them to do anything is, is pulling teeth because they just, they just don't want to move their bodies. They don't want to exert themselves and they don't want to move their bodies. And they don't want to listen to anything other than something that's coming from their screen. And that's just tragic. It's not, it's not irrevocable. Um, one of the people I've talked to is a person who puts children through a four week process. Uh, the first two weeks of which are hell, because the children are fighting you every step of the way. But by the end of that four week process, they're actually, the parents say, oh my God, it's like I've got my child back again. I can talk to them and they will talk back to me like a person. Yeah, so it's, um, it's not irrevocable, but it's serious what's going on. It's really serious. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>